Alright comrades, well today we're loading some magazines and I have to lube the loader, so here we go. Perfect, like a glove. ODS 1775 suppressor test and we're going to be running the Sandman K for the test. Three rounds of Fiocchi 124 grain and then we're going to put the suppressor on and hopefully we should have two groups that are one group. All right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but that looks like one group to me. And what I mean by that is like three of the rounds aren't here and three of them over here or off the target or something. They're essentially in the same spot, which tells me that that can is playing nice with Brian's suppressor alignment job. I think we're good to go. She's ready to be suppressed and she's ready to run. Sometime later. What's up everybody, welcome back to the VSO Gun Channel. Long awaited video, stop one, leg one of the testing on the ODS 1775. And you guys will notice that this gun is in pieces because I actually feel very bad about what we did to this gun. Normally, we stop around the 1500, 1700 round mark for a headspace check and a cleaning. This gun was run much longer and almost the entire time the gun was suppressed. And I'll explain why. I'll be honest and say that we had some malfunctions with this gun that were very strange. Because of that, we extended the testing trying to replicate those malfunctions. Quick disclaimer, the mildly edited footage from those tests in support of the ODS 1775 will be available free to the public on our Patreon and Subscribestar pages. You won't have to pay to see those videos or anything like that, but my hope is while you're there at the page that you'll consider uh, contributing to support of the VSO gun channel. Now that said, what was happening with the gun? Periodically, we were seeing a live round be ejected from the gun in the loading sequence. Hey, hold up. There your feed. Stop. You guys see that? No. This is a magazine failure. This round came out of that magazine. And we're not talking like this happened once or twice. We're talking like this happened like 20 or so times uh, during the initial run. And that is indicative to me of some kind of systemic issue. Usually when we see that sort of thing, we immediately attribute it to excessive carrier speed if the gun is suppressed, uh, usually the carrier speed will be higher. It causes some more violence inside the gun than would normally occur during a standard operating cycle. Cause some jostling in the gun and then causes some rounds to pop out of the magazine and they do strange things. However, upon further inspection, we noticed from reviewing the test matrix that it happened exclusively with Magpul magazines. For anybody who isn't in the know, or is a Magpul fanboy, I'm going to explain something to you very quickly. And that is that the Magpul magazine, the AK-47 magazine from Magpul, is basically as low as you can go on the spectrum of magazines and still get a pass as somebody who's not trying to dick over their customers. So we said, okay, well, let's go out and test some of those magazines. So what I did, took the ODS out of the equation, took the Wasser 10 out, and tried to see if we could replicate the problem with a couple of the worst magazines that we had from the first day of testing with the ODS. Now, to be honest, the sample size was rather small and also very selective on a subset of the magazines that we used, and we were able to get it to replicate. What the hell? So then we replicated the test again with the ODS 1775 unsuppressed this time, and we had no failures. Now, what that tells me is we're kind of reverting to our original theory here. The only problem I have with the carrier speed hypothesis is that the ODS 1775 does not indicate like a normal AK does as far as throwing the casings are concerned. So if you take a regular AK out there, it's gonna fling those casings you know, 20 yards or so. The ODS is doing like half of that or a third of that. So I'm a little bit skeptical of that. If you take this magazine and drop it on the ground and it spits out rounds, I don't care what kind of magazine it is, it's wrong. It should not do that. When a magazine is fully loaded, the feed lips should not flex and allow rounds to, to pop out of the top of the magazine. That's bad. That is why we drop test magazines. When you drop it, it is accelerated towards the ground. When it hits the ground, the 
rounds inside, compress the spring and follower, and they keep going because they are not coupled to the actual body that stopped when it hit the concrete. That allows them to then get a run at the feed lips. And because of that, there's an air bubble created, and that run at the feed lips will allow them to pop out. That is the mechanism by which rounds fling out of a magazine when you drop it. The same thing can happen inside the gun. So if we look at what's going on inside the ODS 1775, what our hypothesis was at this point, having amended it through some of that testing, was that the suppressor was causing excessive carrier speed. It was then hitting a partially loaded, flimsy, magpul-lipped magazine and causing an air bubble to occur in the magazine that then allowed the rounds to get a run at the feed lip. We went out yet again with the ODS 1775, resuppressed it, and we got a shipment from my friends at Gun Mag Warehouse. They are my source for magazines that I use on a regular basis. When I'm in a pinch and need magazines, they're the people that I go to. What they did for us is they sent us five bulgies, five Pro Mags, five Tapcos, and, comma, pause for effect, five Bakelite magazines so that we could go back out, add five Magpul magazines to it. All of those magazines ran flawlessly, and also the Magpul magazines ran flawlessly. Although at this point in time, the gun is getting very dirty and getting relatively tight. So we're gonna continue to run those magazines in the next leg of the testing to see if we can replicate those failures in a higher volume of fire because again, none of the results from these series of tests were done in a manner to be statistically significant. We need to do more testing to see how that is going to go in the future. So suppressed, maybe use a little bit better magazine out of your ODS 1775. So because I expended so much time giving the explanation for uh, our testing and why we didn't stop when we were supposed to stop, we're gonna quickly run through this gun, talk about some of the things that we uncovered during testing and how things are going. Starting at the back, the stock, the Magpul stock, the MOE stock, we are big fans of the MOE stock here, not the folding Zukov stock, that thing's a piece of trash, do not buy that. This thing's pretty solid. Moving forward, the trunnion. On the rear trunnion, we do see a little bit of impacting, but nothing that's super major, especially considering that we shot the gun suppressed so heavily, we expected to see a little bit of impacting going on there. It is not giving me any cause for concern. It looks better than the Wasser trunnion than I have, well, it looked better than the washer trunnion when the washer trunnion was new. The internal components, as far as the trigger mechanism and things like that, those were the ALG components. And this is where I have a little bit of pause because they look remarkably clean. And so I did some digging and it looks to me like the ALG parts deviate from the Kami spec quite substantially. We're talking like 20 Rockwell points higher on the hardness and I'm concerned that that may cause some problems down the road because they are pristine. They look like they are almost unused except for being a little bit dirty. And that gives me a little bit of pause because those parts, especially like the sear and the disconnector and things, should be pretty shiny and they're not really. So that tells me that they're pretty hard and they may cause problems in the gun later. Moving forward, the rails look good. The only thing that I will say about the rails is that on the ejector, there's a little bit of a gouge out of the ejector. It seems to eject fine, as I said previously. The one thing I will point out is that we see no sharing of impact between the two surfaces where the carrier closes. And because of that, we do see a little bit of peening right here on what I'm gonna call the primary locking lugs stop. All of the rivets look really good. I'm just gonna run through the rivets really quick. I don't see any that give me any pause. The, the rivets look like rivets. Slowly. This gun is so dirty. And the only thing that's keeping this gun running at this point is the fact that we keep lubing the shit out of it. Well, what we actually found is there was a little bit of procession in the rail. It moved forward a little bit and caused a little bit of binding here at the front. Once we cleaned it up and then uh, reset that, no problems whatsoever. Uh, that happened at about 1,700 rounds. The Merc handguard, guys and gals, this thing is a tank. About six, seven magazines through the gun until it started to get too hot to hold. 
or you needed to really consider gloves, pulls down relatively quickly. The only thing that we can say about the Merc as far as continuous improvement, and this information has been passed on to Brian, is that we roached the heat shield. So it is toast. And our suggestion to him is to go about twice the thickness on that heat shield to try and keep it from warping under high heat. Now, as far as accolades on the Merc handguard, Final QC on this thing is excellent. They've gone through, used a gratuitous amount of Loctite. They treat it as life-saving equipment, you can tell, because this thing is not coming off unless you want it to come off when you want it to come off. The finish on the gun looks absolutely immaculate still, and I know that doesn't mean a whole lot to some people because, you know, it is the age of spray and pray with, with finishing on guns. However, there are a lot of people out there that are doing Cerakote work that don't know what they're doing or not doing it properly. And this gun showcases that it was done properly. And to explain that, I took the dust cover and to clean it, I put it in the ultrasonic cleaner for like two days. And we saw no finish degradation except for where I had scraped it off manually by throwing the gun on the ground. Carrier and piston. The rivets in the piston look fine. They're both nearly invisible on both sides. That's how you want them to be. You want them to look as though they are part of the carrier. The piston is still mobile. It should not move a whole lot, but it should move a few degrees in either direction, and you should be able to hear it, so that's good. The piston head looks still really good. As far as impacting on the carrier is concerned, there are a few areas that we want to look at. Remember I said earlier about the ALG trigger and hammer being a little bit harder than the spec? Well, this is where we're going to see our first indicator of that. This part of the carrier is designed to impact the hammer first. And you can see that there is a fair amount of peening on that thing. I don't think that it is going to create a problem. The concern being that as this thing continues to deform, it may interfere with the rear trunnion and cause the gun to lock up at the rear. If the gun is sticking at the rear, that's an indicator that you've got some serious damage to the thing and you should probably reprofile it. You should also look at the components to test their hardness. Because of the differential hardness in the hammer, we are seeing some damage. Now, that said, this is an Alton finished bolt carrier group and it looks really good. That finish did really well. It cleaned up super easy. As far as other damage to the uh, carrier is concerned, we are seeing a little bit of a folding of material here at the base of the carrier. It's not a cause for concern at this point in time. The concern being that ultimately, if it gets really bad, then that C that you can see there will start to close. And as it starts to close, it's going to start gripping the bolt shaft harder and harder, and it may cause functionality issues. Right now, it is very benign. We're not entirely sure what is causing that. It does ride over the hammer. It does also periodically come into contact with the ammunition in the magazine, hint, hint. As far as the rails on the carrier are concerned, they both look good. The only thing that we should note is there is a tiny burr on the left side rail. And it, again, not a cause for concern, but it's something that we should mention. Now moving on to the bolt. The shaft, the back of the shaft where the hammer stops, it looks fine. I was a little bit concerned about that because of the hardness of the hammer. If that was going to mushroom that at all, it looks like it's doing just fine. The firing pin looks fine. Doesn't seem to be any kind of indicator right there. The extractor looks great. No cause for concern there. The primary and secondary locking lugs still look immaculate on this thing. There is a little bit of polishing of finish at the front of the bolt where it picks up ammunition. That is to be expected. The forward camming surface on the bolt looks fine. And to understand what that means, the carrier runs to the back, drags the bolt and rotates it. And then as it returns into spring tension, it flings forward and smacks into the bolt in the channel there. It looks fine there. Now moving on to sections of the bolt that uh, are a little bit concerning for me moving forward. There is a, uh, the only term I can use is a divot right here at the neck. I'm not sure what is causing that. It could be interacting with the ammunition. It could also be it interacting with the hard part of the hammer. It is a little bit concerning because I've not seen one do that before. It is taking a decent chunk out of the thing. 
The other thing, there is a chip, a small chip out of the rearward camming surface. So again, back to our diagram of how this thing works. When the cartridge fires, this thing slingshots to the rear and smacks into the bolt, camming it over, rotating it, and pulling it to the rear. That surface has got a little bit of a chip out of it. What we're going to do now is go ahead and go over and do the intermediate headspace of the thing to see how it's doing and basically close up shop for this video. No go gauge in, but I want you guys to conceptualize something really quick. Between the go gauge and the field gauge, which is the end of service gauge, there is about 11 thousandths of space. The no go gauge is located somewhere in the center, depending on which one you're using. If you're using a SAMI spec, it's different than the CISP spec, but it's the same general range. And we use the no go gauge as a safety check. Basically, if it passes a no go gauge, there's no way it can fail on a field gauge. A stripped bolt in a carrier. We go ahead and close it. And then I have a force gauge here. And what we're gonna do is we just take a rod and put it in there. And then we force push for about 20 kilograms of force on this thing. And that's not a small amount of force either. So you can see there we have 20 kilograms of force and we did not get a close on that thing. So this thing passes headspace with flying colors. Alrighty guys, well that about wraps it up for us on the first leg of the testing on the ODS 1775. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember, the full lightly edited footage of our testing on the ODS will be available on both Patreon and Subscribestar. No cost to you guys, but please also consider uh, supporting us here at the VSO Gun channel however you can. We don't expect you guys to do that, but we do appreciate it whenever possible. Thank you guys for joining us. I hope that you guys are looking forward to the next round of testing on the ODS 1775.